The coldest part of our planet, Antarctica, keeps surprising us. Take a look at this waterfall named Blood Falls. Reddish water falls from the white ice. Scientists concluded that the color is related to iron. The water coming from the glacier oxidizes and rusts when it's exposed to oxygen, and the red color occurs. Step on Mount Gandig. It lays eggs. Well, maybe not real eggs, but the stones certainly look like dinosaur eggs. That's why the mountain got its fame. The, let's call them stone eggs, formed in one part of the mountain over 500 million years ago. Interestingly, this phenomenon repeats once every 30 years. Eggs come out in various sizes and shades. The stones appear on the surface of the cliff. A study made in the area has revealed that the composition of the stones of the cliff isn't similar to other parts of the mountain. Here, calcareous rocks rule. They're more prone to erosion. They ripen off day by day. It took three decades for the stones to get to the egg shape. Yet, it's still a mystery how these rock formations can be so perfectly spherical and smooth. According to scientists, every stone egg has an organic core. They're made of shells, plant remains, fish teeth, and skeletons. Maybe this has something to do with it. Gulu Village is close to the stone eggs. Locals believe that these eggs are sacred. Villagers associate it with good fortune. In fact, nearly every family has one of these eggs in their house. Unfortunately, there are only about 70 eggs left, so if you want to see them, you gotta hurry up! The Richet structure is a circular geological phenomenon in the Sahara Desert near Mauritania. It's made out of rocks in layers, and these layers look very much like rings. No wonder the unique structure even got NASA's attention. Up from the sky, the geological feature seems to be swirling and spinning. Scientists are still not sure how these rings got there. Some say it was an asteroid impact. Many others believe that it was a natural geological process. To them, the Richat structure is an uplifted and eroded dome. Geologists often classify it as a domed anticline. The scientists discovered that the rocks at the center are older than the ring-shaped outer rocks. So it seems like the stones have been eroded to flat rock layers. Anyway, there's no valid explanation for this phenomenon, and the 28-mile-long mystery of the Sahara is still to be solved. Number 4 is Rapa Nui, or Isla de Pasqua, but I bet you know it as Easter Island. Yeah, it's got three names. It was discovered by Jacob Rogovine, who actually never intended to look for that island. He just casually landed there one Sunday. That's where the name comes from. Jacob was supposed to find Terra Australis. Disclaimer, it's not Australia. This one never existed and was nothing but a hypothetical continent. Plus, he wanted to peek at Davis Land, which was believed to have once been seen by Edward Davis, the pirate, not Edward Davis the saxophone player. Jacob failed at that too, though nobody ever saw that island except for the pirate Davis. Jacob may have failed to discover some lands he wanted to, but he discovered Easter Island instead. This is an island and special territory of Chile, located in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. It's on my list because nearly 1,000 stone statues called Moai were found there. They were created by the Rapa Nui people. Nearly all statues represent gigantic heads, but there are also a small number of figures kneeling with their hands over their stomachs. Each statue represented chiefs or other important members of Easter Island society. To curve those statues, the locals used volcanic stones that were softened. Our next stop is the gateway to the underworld. Nah, don't worry. This is just how people label Darvaza gas crater in Turkmenistan. This giant natural gas crater has been there for five decades. This crater is continuously burning gases. The president of the country wants experts to find a way to extinguish this continuous firing pit. This site was created by people accidentally in 1971 while working on a natural gas project. Ever since then, the flames have been on, and it's become a tourist attraction. Mysterious constructions are sometimes built in our era, too. We don't have to go millions of years ago to long-gone civilizations. Edward Leedskollen single-handedly built a structure called Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. He didn't use any large machinery. He carved and sculpted more than 1,100 tons of coral rock in 28 years until 1951. 
It's a mystery how he managed to do it all by himself. Leedscallen sculpted the sedimentary rock into different objects, such as walls, tables, chairs, a fountain, and a sundial. There's of course a legend behind this mystery too. He was inspired to build the structure after being abandoned by his fiancée on their wedding day. Uh-oh, runaway bride! Well, he wanted to prove his love to her and the world, so he wanted to do something extraordinary. Well, he definitely nailed it! Now, let's talk a little bit about the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles. There are millions of circular patches in hundreds of miles, ranging from 10 to 65 feet in diameter. They're called fairy circles because they look like a fairy or an otherworldly creature made them. These are essentially oval-shaped soil surrounded by grass. There are a lot of local beliefs surrounding the creator of these marks, yet science says something else. Biologists and mathematicians have been puzzled by the mystery of the Namibian fairy circles for decades. There is more than one theory to explain this phenomenon. Here's one popular theory. The water is limited in the desert, so plants compete to reach the water. Some plants expand and thrive into a patch, but smaller plants nearby cannot get the necessary water to live. In the end, some vegetation disappears, and the remaining ones stay at the patch's edges. That's why they form such regular distant gaps. What if I tell you that there is a hill in Lay wow. City, India, where instead of rolling downwards, things roll uphill? It's an optical illusion. The road looks like it's a sloping hill because of its surrounding landscapes, yet the road actually goes down. These kinds of hills are called magnetic hills or gravity hills. Scientific explanations vary. The most common theory says that the hill has such a strong magnetic force that it can pull cars in the vicinity. Now, how about seeing some flaming rocks? Yanartash spread over an area of over 3 square miles. The place is located on a rocky mountain in southwest Turkey near the town of Chiaralea. Yanartash got its name from its appearance. It literally means flaming stone. The rocks have been flaming for at least 2,500 years, and they'll probably keep burning for the coming decades. The mountain where the rocks are is an inactive volcano, so it's full of tiny fumaroles that release gases such as methane. The gas ignites when it comes into contact with oxygen and creates the flaming effect. Uh, and by the way, back in the day, sailors used the flames as a natural lighthouse, as it's really close to the sea. Today, it's more of a tourist attraction, though. Hikers love it, too. Now, walk on this frozen Lake Abraham in Canada. In winter, the frozen water gets filled with ice bubbles. It looks magical, but these white orbs aren't that safe. They consist of flammable methane gas. Ew. Beauty can be misleading. The next one is from Racetrack Death Valley, USA. There is a dry lake bed with moving rocks. Now these odd rocks look as if they've been pushed or dragged by someone or something. They leave both a trail and a mystery behind. The force behind all this is now understood. Surprise! It's the wind and some ice. Scientists say the wind pushes the rocks during brief windows when the soil is covered with ice. Now I can't help you hear the word Paris and a picture of the Eiffel Tower comes straight into your mind. Or croissants. Or maybe you imagine going on a romantic stroll in the city of love, or croissants. But not many know that right below the bustling city of Paris, there is a series of underground passages, the catacombs. They're home to the remains of more than 6 million people. But it wasn't always like that. Paris used to be a vast swamp. It was because most of the city was submerged in water at one time. Due to this, once the areas rose to the surface, the ground became rich in minerals, the most important being limestone. To extract it and use it to develop Paris, underground mines were dug up somewhere around the 14th century. They were dug horizontally to prevent collapse and to deal with the weight of the ceiling. Most of these mines were set up on the right side of the River Seine. Soon, Paris started expanding beyond its old city walls. Here's where it got tricky. The city started building on top of the land where they had dug all those tunnels. This caused some big problems, like the ground collapsing. In 1774, one of the roads in the suburbs collapsed about 100 feet into the ground. 
due to rising safety concerns, officials decided to abandon the mines. The quarries were checked, and the tunnels were renovated to avoid future disasters. The bones ended up in the tunnels because of another major problem Paris faced a few years later. The growing population of the city caused an increase in the number of bodies. Cemeteries became overcrowded. And the city was actually so bad that, at one point, bodies could not be taken care of properly. They started to rot and spread harmful bacteria. So those who were in charge of Paris got an idea. They picked a new spot that was like a secret hideout for bones, one of the old mines. The process of moving the bones from cemeteries to the tunnel started in the late 1780s. They began with the biggest cemetery in Paris, the San Innocen Cemetery. They didn't want to scare people, so they moved the bones at night. The remains went into two big holes in the ground and then got stacked in the tunnels by the quarry workers. They continued moving the bones until Paris developed into a city in the 1860s. The official name given to the collection of mines turned cemetery was the Paris Municipal Ossuary. But this name never became popular, and the tunnels instead became known as the catacombs. While the bones were still being added to the collection, the officials saw fit to open the place for public viewing in the year 1809. Tourists had to make a prior appointment and sign a guest book. As time passed, famous people started visiting, including the future King Charles X, Austrian Emperor Francis I, and Napoleon III. Of course, the rules for visiting have been changing over time. But now the catacombs, also known as the ossuary of Denferrochenro, have become a famous tourist spot. Around 5 million people come to explore it every year. What drives them? Well, in addition to the creepy but rich history, the catacombs are also considered one of the most haunted places on Earth. And there are several unsolved mysteries surrounding them. Some years back, a camcorder was discovered in the catacombs with a bit of footage. ABC Family showed the video in their documentary. In the clip, you can see a man very deep inside the catacombs, exploring alone. The video is from his point of view, and he sees something strange. He runs away terrified and eventually drops his camera. What happened to this man is still unknown. He was never found or identified. There are also reports of people getting lost in the catacombs, the most famous being a doorkeeper who got lost in 1793. His body was found 11 years later near an exit. How he passed away remains a mystery. There are also some not-so-eerie but equally strange mysteries surrounding the catacombs. There are people who like exploring the tunnels on their own. They're known as cataphiles. These people go into the quarries that have been abandoned to the public and long forgotten. Some explorers discovered secret water pools in the abandoned areas, and people would go to take a dip there. In 2004, police patrolling an unexplored area came across a 5,300-square-foot cavern with a movie theater. There was a screen, projection equipment, some classic movies, and even chairs. There was also a restaurant-like setting nearby, three telephone lines, and, well, electricity, which hinted that a group of people had been living there or regularly visiting. But when the police came back three days later with experts to find the source of the electricity, they found that the wire had been cut off. Only a note was left behind. Do not try to find us. Such enthusiasts existed in the past, too. Once, a Parisian farmer did the same and came across button mushrooms growing in the catacombs. He saw an opportunity to make easy money, and he actually created mushroom farms in the tunnels. He even got official permission for it. By 1950, a hundred farmers had been working inside growing mushrooms. There's also a scary legend about the catacombs that some people believe in. According to it, at midnight, unexplainable voices can be heard in the catacombs. They try to convince people to go further inside the catacombs until they can't find their way out. There's no strong evidence whether this story is true or not, but thinking about it is still scary. Due to safety issues, today, only a small part of the catacombs can be legally toured by the public, less than 2 miles, while the catacombs go on for 200 miles. And still, the tour is an hour long, and it perfectly captures what's worth seeing. Solo traveling is extremely dangerous, as there is the possibility of getting lost. Mm, no thanks. In 2017, 
two teenagers entered the system through a secret passage. They were found three days later and had to be treated for hypothermia. The tunnels, damp and old, have an average temperature of 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Keep in mind that the entrance alone is uncomfortable enough to turn some people away. To get inside, you have to go down a winding staircase that takes you a little more than 65 feet below the surface. In the beginning, you find yourself in a well-lit room filled with interesting information and displays. But as you move forward, the place gets eerily silent. You pass through a creepy entrance that boldly declares this in French, which when translated English is something like, stop, this is the empire of doom. It's not exactly a warm welcome, and that's because the Paris catacombs are known for their haunted reputation. As you move deeper, the sounds of the world above fade away, and soon you are surrounded by the silence of the earth below. The bones themselves are placed strategically, almost in artistic patterns. This was the idea of a man who was once in charge of the place, he turned the bones into a kind of underground museum with cool structures like columns, plaques, altars, and even some weirdly shaped forms that some people consider art. Popular all year round, the catacombs become particularly loaded around Halloween. People organize special parties or events near the place too. But the most bizarre thing was offered by the catacombs themselves through Airbnb. The famous rental service allowed two guests to sleep in the catacombs. They were offered a bed for Halloween night and breakfast. Upon checking in, they were told tales in the history of the catacombs. This way, they went to bed fully aware of the fact that they were sleeping among the remains of 6 million people. Yes, it remains to be seen. For years, scientists have been struggling to explain bizarre sounds. Some repeating, some heard only once, that come from the dark depths of the ocean. From bewildering hums to worrying bloops, the water transmits outlandish acoustic phenomena. One of these mysterious noises got named the upsweep. For the first time, this long train of sounds was registered in 1991 in the Pacific Ocean. One of the most unusual things about this signal is that it keeps changing, as if trying to confuse researchers even more. Like some unearthly howl, it varies from high to low frequencies and then back again. And you can hear it better in the spring and fall than in the winter and summer. Why the upsweep? It's simple. The sound travels from the bottom of the ocean towards its surface, as if sweeping up. Scientists do have a theory explaining this phenomenon. The activity of undersea volcanoes Hot lava pouring into ice-cold ocean water could theoretically create such noises, but there's no proof found yet. Plus, the sound has been declining since 1991, even though it can still be detected. The bloop is the name given to an ultra-low frequency and incredibly powerful underwater sound that was recorded in 1997 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The bloop continued for approximately one minute. Having started from a low rumble, it gradually rose in frequency. It also kind of mimicked the noise created by marine animals, but its volume was so great that no living creature known to science could have made it. When the bloop occurred, underwater microphones managed to record it from a distance of 3,000 miles away. Rumor has it that the noise might have something to do with the fictional half-octopus monster Cthulhu or some other colossal deep water creature. But if you don't believe in monsters, science has another explanation, iceberg fracturing. The thing is that ice quakes recorded in the Scotia Sea resemble the mysterious bloop a bit too much for it to be a coincidence. The whistle resembles this annoying sound when a kettle of boiling water is telling you it's time to make a cup of tea. But even though it may not be as blood-curdling as some other bizarre ocean sounds, it doesn't make it any less mysterious. Plus, the whistle is very elusive. In 1997, only one underwater microphone was able to pick it up, and therefore, researchers didn't manage to pinpoint the source of the noise. The most likely cause of the sound is an eruption of one of the submarine volcanoes. Have you ever heard of Julia? No, not your neighbor. 
I'm talking about this otherworldly sound. Listen to it. It was recorded in 1999 by the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The source of the sound was most likely a large iceberg that ran aground somewhere in Antarctica. The sound was so loud that it was heard over a huge territory, and its duration was about 2 minutes and 43 seconds. Slow down. That's the name given to a sound recorded in 1997 in the equatorial Pacific Ocean. The sound was called this way because it slowly decreased in frequency over 7 minutes or so. It's been picked out a few more times since it was recorded for the first time. The source of the sound isn't very mysterious. Most likely, it was produced by a massive iceberg that became grounded in Antarctica, or it was caused by moving ice. By that, I mean the friction produced by a large ice sheet moving over land. The loneliest whale sound is often called the 52 Hertz whale because the animal that creates it calls at a unique for these creatures frequency. When you listen to this sound, it sounds like a low bass note. At the same time, it's much higher than the normal frequency of the whale call, which rings between 10 and 40 hertz. Interestingly, scientists have been listening to the world's loneliest whale for decades, but haven't managed to figure out its precise location. Nobody knows whether the mammal is male or female, what species it is, or if the animal is still alive. After all, for the last time, its call was recorded in 2004. Earth-shaking booming sounds have been reverberating off some parts of North Carolina for more than 150 years. Called Seneca guns, they're most often heard near the coast. The sounds are so powerful that they often rattle window panes and sometimes vibrate entire buildings. They can last from 1 to almost 10 seconds. Even though scientists haven't cracked this mystery yet, there are some theories. They range from earthquakes to severe distant storms and quarry blasts. But even though the ground trembles every time the phenomenon occurs, no seismic activity coincides with these events. So far, scientists have come to the conclusion that the mysterious sounds happen in the atmosphere, not on or under the surface of our planet. If this theory is true, bolides might be the answer. These extremely bright meteors often explode once they enter Earth's atmosphere. Or, Seneca guns might be born in the ocean. Sometimes, when enormous waves collide far away from the shore, you can hear it, even if you're nowhere near the coast. Seneca guns are a type of skyquakes. You don't need to travel to a particular part of the world to hear one of those. Mysterious sonic booms ramble from the sky everywhere, from the US to India and Japan. Just like Seneca guns, this sound phenomenon occurs mostly near the coast or a big body of water. Rattling glassware and windows in the nearby houses, skyquakes could be connected with ultra-fast airplanes breaking the sound barrier. But people started hearing the first skyquakes in 1824. The theories trying to explain this phenomenon include sand dunes shifting, meteors entering the atmosphere, distant volcanoes erupting, Earth's crust cracking during earthquakes, and even gas bursting out of underground vents in the sea or lake bottom. In different countries all over the world, people get paralyzed with fear after hearing otherworldly trumpet sounds that seem to be coming from the sky. The inhabitants of the US, Canada, Australia, Germany, and the Philippines have already heard this hair-raising noise since it was first recorded in 2008. These sounds are sometimes called the sound of apocalypse. And although until recently, nobody could understand the origin of the sounds, NASA claims that there is nothing to be afraid of. The noise can be coming from our own planet. Usually, it's quiet and thus inaudible to the human ear. But when it gets louder, the outcome is the very trumpet sounds that scare people all over the world. Bristol Hum started in the 1970s when hundreds of Bristol inhabitants began to talk about a bizarre noise audible only at night. 
The noise was a low-level hum, and nobody could identify or trace the source of the sound. But the strangest thing about the noise was that one day, it stopped as abruptly as it started. But not before people in other towns across Britain reported hearing similar sounds. Some time ago, the mysterious sound returned. In 2015, a group of French scientists claimed that they had solved the mystery of the Bristol hum. They stated that the culprit was ocean waves that made the ocean floor vibrate. But while it was all good and well, it didn't explain why the sound was around for only several years or why it chose to return. If you ever come to the town of Taos in New Mexico, don't let another strange and unexplained phenomenon send you running for the hills. This phenomenon is a faint, low-frequency hum ringing in the desert air and grating on your nerves. Even stranger, only 2% of people who live in Taos hear this noise. But for those who do, it's unstoppable torture. On top of that, everyone describes the sound in a different way, from a quiet whir to an eerie hum or even persistent buzz. And while some people believe that the Taos hum is the result of unusual acoustics, the others suspect a bad case of mass hysteria. No one has located the origin of the hum yet. It was hot in the tropics, a type of heat unknown to the men aboard the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria ships, led by Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. It had been months since these men left their home cities in Europe, and until then, Europe was all they knew. They were given a difficult and even dangerous task. Spain hired Columbus to find a new western route to Asia. They needed new routes for trading and buying spices, but it was far from a simple job. I mean, crossing the ocean never is. Little did those sailors know that their lives were about to change forever. Land in sight! Someone must have shouted on board. But when they finally stepped on that new foreign land, they discovered they were not in Asia. They had landed in the Americas. You've probably heard this tale before. Historically speaking, Columbus arrived in the Americas in 1492. But what would have happened if Columbus's ship had faced a lethal storm in the Atlantic Ocean and had never made it to the new land? What would today's history look like? First things first, nobody discovered anything. When we say that the Americas were discovered, we're kind of ignoring the millions of people who already lived there. You see, the Americas were only discovered from Europe's point of view. Columbus would only have discovered something if when he got there, he was faced with acres and acres of empty land. But that was not the case at all. Second, Columbus was not the first explorer to land in the Americas. Believe it or not, the Vikings approached American shores in the 10th century. Their expeditions have been well documented and accepted by scholars. Here's what might have happened. Around the year 1000 CE, Viking explorer Leif Erikson sailed to a place called Vinland. Cute name, huh? It's now a region in Canada called Newfoundland. But his crew didn't stay too long. They arrived to find 10 Native Americans napping under their overturned canoes. They attempted some trade, but I'm guessing the Vikings weren't too friendly and the Americans didn't really like them. The Vikings' account of the encounter shows they felt outnumbered and menaced, so they sailed away back to their land. That makes sense, right? As I said earlier, there were millions of people living in the ginormous continent of the Americas. Any foreigner would be outnumbered there. Now take a look at what North America looked like before our buddy Chris got there. It was not divided into the normal states we're used to. And if Columbus had never arrived, the United States would probably never have been united to begin with. After all, there were hundreds of first Americans living in these lands, and they lived amongst their own tribes, quite different from the Europeans. It's not accurate to think that there were no political systems going on in the Americas before Europeans arrived. We just need to understand that they were different from what we're used to today. When Europeans arrived, they imported their belief systems with them, from religious beliefs and language systems to things as simple as clothing habits. If the Americas had developed on their own, maybe their sense of fashion would be completely different today. You see, Europeans had a developed sense of fashion by the time they arrived in the West. They wore things such as this and this. 
But those don't really work in the tropics, do they? For them, fashion had to do with showing a certain economic status, while in the Americas, that didn't exist. For Native Americans, clothing was mainly functional and related to the weather. In warmer climates, Native people would wear short-like cloths to cover their intimate parts. They would walk bare-chested and use shoes known as moccasins. Yes, similar to the moccasins you probably own. In colder climates, they would resort to using leather and fur parkas. Of course, there was always the special clothing used for ceremonial purposes. So I'm guessing that if Columbus never reached the Americas, brands such as the Gap, Hollister, and Forever 21 would have never existed. But we could live with that, couldn't we? Here's a wild thought. Let's say that by the 1700s, Native Americans had developed complex engineering skills. They built big boats, maybe a bit smaller in size than the traditional European ships, and decided to venture across the ocean. Let's say they were the ones who arrived on European shores, in places such as Spain and Portugal. They carried gifts and goods with them for trading, of course. This was also a common practice amongst them back home, known as potlatch. Sure, they were received with suspicion by the Europeans, who had only ever traded with Asia. But with this inverted encounter, a different type of relationship began between Native Americans and Europeans. Since Europeans didn't claim ownership of the Americas, the people from the so-called New Land weren't considered inferior to them. Actually, they stood side by side as equals, each one with their own power and set of knowledge. Native Americans taught Europeans a new type of ruling system, a more decentralized one. So modern-day structures of government would look really different. Maybe Europeans decided that four years was a long time for someone to hold decision power, so they implemented smaller and more frequent elections. Oh, and the landscape of European cities also changed a lot. Instead of huge statues made of copper and bronze showing men and ships on their way to the Americas, the Europeans built totem poles in honor of their alliances with first Americans. In terms of medical and medicinal knowledge, they had a lot to exchange about. While Europeans were making advances in traditional medicine, Americans had developed an impressive knowledge of herbs that could heal a series of things. Before they knew it, Europeans were selling different varieties of plants in their pharmaceutical establishments. They had one big barrier though, language. Since Europeans never arrived on American shores, they also never taught their language to Americans. So maybe in this scenario, both cultures brought in their best linguists and tried creating a new language from scratch. Something that could be comprehensible from both perspectives and that could encompass both of their worldviews. The implications of this on modern-day life would be really profound if you stop to think about it. Let's say that this newly created language involved some symbols and drawings in it. You see, Native Americans often told stories using symbols known as pictograms. They were quite literal sometimes. As you can see, a mountain was represented by, well, a mountain. It's crazy to think that this system of communication has been around for 5,000 years since it was actually invented by the Sumerians. And hey, maybe even our laptop keyboards would come equipped with these symbols, and you could write more visually hybrid and fun emails than the ones you write today. The American landscape would have also changed. You see, if neither Columbus nor any of the other European dudes that went after him reached the so-called new land, Central and Latin American cities would look completely different than they do today. Maybe the bustling empires of the time, such as the Inca, the Maya, and the Aztec, would have grown immensely. To be fair, they were already pretty big by the time Europeans got there. Some pre-Columbian Maya cities were as big as medieval London and Paris in terms of population. But oh my, the Mayan Empire would have grown so much that it could have spread out all over of Central America. They could have developed their pyramid building craft up to the point that they managed to build an even larger pyramid than the Giza Pyramid in Egypt. So tourists would come from all over the world to visit. Ah, and in South America, let's just say the region could have turned into a huge forest, bigger than the Amazon. The Inca could have spread through the Andes and then into the mainland. Places such as Brazil and Argentina never existed. But in their place, there would have been dreamy tropical settlements, 
which would have become a worldwide reference in sustainable living. Have you ever wondered why mountains seem so still and silent? Well, prepare to be amazed because these majestic landforms have some hidden talents. You see, mountains are actually quite the performers. They have their own unique songs and dance routines. What does it mean and how does it work? Well, let's see. Get ready for a chilling revelation. Mount Everest has a secret nighttime symphony. And this mysterious music will send shivers down your spine. When darkness falls over the Himalayas, a strange eerie chorus echoes through the glaciers surrounding the majestic peak. A team of researchers embarked on a quest to unravel the mystery. Led by the glaciologist Evgeny Podolsky, they trekked through the freezing temperatures of the Nepalese Himalayas. Their goal? To uncover the source of these hair-raising noises. The team was amazed by the incredible size and beauty of Mount Everest. During the day, the weather was nice and they could work comfortably. However, when night came, it became extremely cold, reaching temperatures as low as minus 5 degrees Fahrenheit. At that moment, something interesting happened. The ice on the mountain started to break apart and make loud booming sounds that echoed through the valley. To solve the mystery, the team used advanced technology that is typically used to measure earthquakes. They placed sensors on the surface of the glacier and listened to the vibrations it created. They also looked at information about temperature and wind. By comparing all of this data, they made a very important and exciting discovery. The culprit behind this frozen orchestra? It's the sudden decrease in temperature. The icy surface of the glacier is very sensitive to these changes, causing it to crack and split with loud booming noises. This discovery helps scientists understand how glaciers behave in a world where climate change is becoming more pronounced. This adventure is really important because it gives scientists who study glaciers and the climate in faraway places like the Himalayas very valuable information. The melting of glaciers in that area is happening really fast. And that's a big problem. It's a serious threat to South Asia. Recent research shows that the glaciers have been melting 10 times faster in the past 40 years compared to the previous 700 years. But this isn't the only reason why mountains can make strange noises. Other mountains might also sing their own songs. For example, Mount Matterhorn. Guess what? Everything around us has its own special rhythm. Objects vibrate at certain frequencies because of their shape and what they're made of. You've probably seen it before with tuning forks and wine glasses. When they're hit with the right frequency, they start shaking and making sounds. But here's something cool. Even mountains have their own groove. They vibrate in their own unique way. Jeffrey Moore and his team of adventurous scientists wanted to find out if mountains can dance to their own music, just like bridges and tall buildings. They thought that the special shapes of mountains might make them vibrate at certain frequencies, which is called resonance. But testing this idea wasn't easy. Unlike buildings that engineers can shake or bridges that vehicles can drive over, mountains are massive and hard. It's hard to make them move on purpose. Not giving up, Moore and his team took on a big project. They wanted to study how the shaking of the earth affected the famous Matterhorn Mountain. This incredible mountain is located on the border of Italy and Switzerland. It looks like a pyramid. It's really tall, reaching about 15,000 feet high. It has four sides facing north, south, east, and west. With the help of helicopters, the scientists put special devices called seismometers in specific places on the mountain. One was placed at the very top and used solar power to work. It was as small as a coffee cup. Another seismometer was tucked beneath the floorboards of a cozy hut on the mountain, and a third one was placed at the base of the mountain to compare the measurements. Together, they were the tiny observers that kept recording the movements of the mountain all the time. And they finally detected it. Even though the mountain's movements are incredibly small, scientists discovered that the Matterhorn gently sways back and forth about once every two seconds. What's truly surprising is that the top of the mountain moves up to 14 times more than its base. The Eiffel Tower kind of does the same thing. This giant iron structure is a pro at handling windy days, and when a storm blows through, 
It's not afraid to show off its swaying skills. It's like the tower is saying, Hey wind, bring it on. But the reason behind the mountain's movement isn't just wind, as it may seem. So, why do mountains do that? Why do they dance and make a humming sound? Are they having a party that we're not invited to? Well, it's all because of something called seismic energy. When earthquakes happen in different parts of the world, their energy travels through the earth and causes the mountains to vibrate. The oceans also join in this mountain music. When waves move across the ocean floor, they create vibrations called micro -seisms. It's like the Earth's own heartbeat, felt all around the world. And guess what? The frequency of these vibrations matches the way the Matterhorn sways. It's like the mountain and the oceans are chilling together. So the next time you see a mountain, remember that it's not just standing still. It's actually part of a global symphony created by the Earth itself. This research helps us learn how earthquakes can affect steep mountains that are prone to landslides and avalanches. It also gives us a new way to appreciate mountains like the Matterhorn. They have their own hidden songs, swaying and vibrating to a mysterious melody deep within the earth. But there's one more pretty cool thing about the mountains. They don't just talk themselves. They may also influence the way we talk. Turns out, Languages spoken in high-altitude areas have special sounds that you won't hear elsewhere. After studying 567 languages, linguists found that 92 of them use a special kind of sound called ejectives. These sounds are made by pushing air out forcefully from the back of the throat. This creates bursts of speech that give these languages their distinctiveness. Scientists were really surprised by this connection. These sounds, like a strong K and ka, are not common in English or European languages. But some indigenous languages in North America and the area between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea have them. What's even more puzzling is that Tibetan languages, spoken in mountains, don't use adjectives. Linguists are curious to unravel this mystery and learn more about how mountains and language are connected. So, why do some languages spoken in the mountains have special sounds? Well, it's a bit of a mystery. Researchers have some cool ideas. One idea is that these sounds might help people keep their throats from getting dry when they talk in the dry air of the mountains. Another idea is that the lower air pressure up there makes it easier to make these sounds. But scientists are still figuring out the real reason. Although some experts are not entirely convinced by this explanation. They say that while geography can influence language, there are other reasons why languages might be similar. Like borrowing words from nearby languages, or being close to each other. But this research has still given us some amazing insights. Mountains not only shape the way our world looks, but they also shape the way we talk. So, the next time you're exploring a mountainous area, listen carefully to the local language. You might hear unique sounds and words that are influenced by the mountains themselves. It's like nature is sharing its own special secrets through the language of the people who live there. And remember that the mountains themselves also have a voice, and they're speaking to us in their own special way. Scientists are still on an exciting adventure to uncover their secrets. So let's see what are some cool things they'll find out in the future. Stay tuned. So tonight, go out and look at the moon through a telescope, and you'll see many craters. No one still knows how they appeared there. Some of them have formed recently. Scientists have discovered a double crater on the moon that appeared for a strange reason. In March, a rocket crashed into the moon, and no one knows who owned it and why it left such a trail. If a regular rocket had fallen there, it would have left one hole. A standard space rocket has a heavy engine on one side and a lighter fuel tank on the other. But this time, there had to be two heavy sides on one rocket to leave a double crater. That's strange. No one knows what it is, and no one has claimed to be the owner. It was probably part of a large three-ton rocket. This piece had been flying in space for several years. At first, astronomers thought it belonged to SpaceX, but the company denied this claim. Also, they thought that China had launched the rocket, but this was also wrong. In the near future, NASA experts hope to find out the truth. The problem with tracking such rockets in space debris is that this is quite expensive. Companies don't want to spend too much money on it. But soon, this will change. 
people will have to spend billions of dollars to monitor garbage or destroy it since it's getting too crowded in space. Space companies will have to solve this problem, as it poses a serious danger to satellites and spacecraft. Just take a look. There are millions of pieces of satellites and rockets flying in space. Some of them are the size of a basketball, others are as tiny as a raindrop. The total weight of all this debris is about 9,000 tons. This is almost 2,000 tons heavier than the Eiffel Tower. Okay, all this garbage is floating there, so what? The problem is that it's not just floating, it's moving at a speed of 17,500 miles per hour. A tennis ball will fall apart into several pieces at such a speed on the surface of our planet because of air resistance. But there's no air in space. Nothing prevents a tiny piece of metal from reaching a speed 20 times faster than the speed of sound. A piece of paint at this speed can easily damage the casing of a spaceship. Once, several shuttle portholes were replaced because of the damage caused by flying chunks of paint. Now imagine what a piece of metal the size of a basketball can do to a spaceship. It could bring down the International Space Station. Many satellites were destroyed by space debris that crashed into them. And when those satellites exploded, they burst into thousands of small parts, which also turned into dangerous flying objects. For example, in 1996, a fragment of a rocket damaged 10 years earlier crashed into a French satellite. In 2009, a failed spacecraft destroyed another commercial ship. As a result of the collision, about 2,300 tracked fragments appeared, as well as lots of tiny untracked ones. Today, satellite operators receive warnings about potential collisions with space debris. But these messages are often either inaccurate or reach the operators too late. Imagine that a screw is flying at great speed toward your satellite. You'll hardly have time to dodge it. Perhaps it won't hit your satellite at all. This uncertainty makes these warning sensors useless. The problem becomes much more serious when it concerns the ISS crew members. A durable spacesuit can't guarantee protection from flying debris. And the station itself is too large to save itself from big objects by dodging. To keep astronauts safe, scientists have a catalog of things that are the size of softballs or bigger. They monitor thousands of fragments and analyze their trajectories, material, and dimensions. Next, they use the pizza box method to dodge garbage. This is the unofficial name for an imaginary square that is used to calculate the risks of a collision with space debris. So imagine a giant pizza box. It is 2.5 miles deep, 30 miles wide, and 30 miles long. Now put the entire International Space Station in this box. Yeah, okay, you can have it with pepperoni. Anyway, if some space object is heading toward the edge of the box, the crew will begin to develop a plan of action. The box's radius is quite large compared to the station, since it's difficult to calculate the debris's trajectory. If there's a chance that something might approach the box, then it can also damage the station. When operators receive a signal about approaching debris, they analyze it. Depending on the data received, the crew begins to act in a certain way. If it's something small and heading for some part of the ISS, the astronaut should evacuate from this part. And after that, they'll do repairs there. If something big is approaching, the entire station can perform an evasive maneuver with the help of the engines or a docked spacecraft. One such trick required about five hours of hard work. The station is a big, clumsy ship, so it's important to know about the threat in advance. From 1999 to 2020, the ISS made 29 maneuvers to avoid collisions. Three of them occurred in 2020. And there will be more since the amount of garbage increases. If some object is too big and fast and can damage critical components, and it's impossible to dodge, the entire crew will have to evacuate. In the future, NASA and other space agencies will have to think about how to destroy this debris or remove it from orbit. One option is catching everything with extensive space nets. One agency suggested developing a solar sail that clings to debris and propels it to a low orbit. Another wanted to use an electrodynamic cable to slow down the speed of space debris with the current. This maneuver will cause space garbage to move toward the surface of Earth and burn up in the atmosphere. But what if one of these pieces still reaches the ground? Even now, many satellite parts fall on Earth. 
Fortunately, this is not so dangerous. The probability of cosmic garbage falling on your house is minimal. In addition, 70% of our planet is covered with water. Of the remaining 30%, only 3-10% to are occupied by people. Almost all space debris falls into the ocean or unpopulated parts of dry land. But let's say some part of a satellite damages your property. In that case, the company that owns the space object will cover the losses. Such cases are rare and occur because of accidents in orbit. But sometimes, companies intentionally abandon their satellites. If a spacecraft is out of order, they turn it off and use the remaining fuel to slow it out of orbit and drop it in a safe place. Almost all such objects fall in the region of the spacecraft cemetery. It's located at the most remote point on Earth, Point Nemo. It's in the southern Pacific Ocean, east of New Zealand. The nearest island is more than a thousand miles away. The distance to the International Space Station is much smaller. It's challenging to get to this place since no ships travel there. That's why most satellites end up in that area. It looks like an endless sea. The ocean there absorbs explosive waves of any power without consequences. Even if some fallen ship or rocket causes a giant wave, it dissipates long before it reaches dry land. Fish and other marine creatures are also not at risk. Point Nemo is one of the least inhabited areas on Earth. Underwater currents carry nutrients through the ocean, and tiny living creatures such as photoplankton and other organisms feed on them. But these currents don't reach Point Nemo. Another way to deliver nutrients in the ocean is wind. But there's almost no wind at Point Nemo. This place doesn't have enough food to let large life forms develop. Just imagine how lonely and silent it is there. Sometimes, a broken rocket breaks this silence, crashing into the water at great speed and descending to the seabed, where thousands of other satellites are waiting to welcome it. Watching a football game is exciting enough. However, what's more exciting is watching a match where things end up weird. During a match between Austria and Denmark, a mysterious hole popped up from nowhere and stopped the game. The players were furious, but also confused by this weird, deep hole. It was a Danish player who brought this to everyone's attention when his leg got stuck. The hole was deep enough to consume his ankle. Luckily, he found it before the game started. Such a situation led to a career-ending accident. He was just showing everyone how deep the hole was. On top of that, the match was delayed by 90 minutes due to a power outage. The fans were confused. Some were frustrated that the team they wanted to support couldn't play, while others found it amusing. During a game between Colombia and Brazil at the 2014 World Cup in Brazil, a giant green locust decided to land on James Rodriguez's arm right after he scored a penalty. The player didn't notice at first. I guess that green guy was a huge football fan, or the locust just wanted to congratulate him in its own way. It's certainly not the first animal to appear in the middle of a football game. Another Brazil-related incident happened when two local clubs were going head-to-head. -head. While the game was in a heat, a dog decided it wanted a piece of the action. It got in the game and furiously went for the ball and turned it into its chew toy. The players were left stunned and agitated with the dog disrupting the flow of the game. Eventually, the officials intervened and spoiled all the fun for our little doggo. In 2006, during a Champions League match between Villarreal and Arsenal, a little grey squirrel zipped across the pitch near the striker. It was also probably just a huge fan. Ever heard a group of foxes invading a pitch? In Dens Park, a bunch of foxes decided to dig around the pitch, probably on the lookout for rabbits. Diego Maradona is one of the best football players in history. The Argentinian was quick, energetic, and wowed audiences all over the world with his passion. However, in a quarterfinal match between Argentina and England during the 1986 World Cup, things went too far when he extended his fist in the air and punched the ball only for it to go behind the opposition's net. Much to the fans' fury, the goal stood. The refs didn't have a clear vision of the goal, even though they should have kept their eyes on the ball. The Argentinians were up one goal and the match eventually ended 2-1 in favor of the Argentinians. They eventually lifted the cup, which solidified Maradona's presence as the greatest of all time. One of the most unforgettable nights was Brazil versus Germany during the 2014 World Cup. 
Both are giants in the game. Both with star-studded players ready to make their country proud. Both teams were crying out for different reasons. Brazil conceded a whopping seven goals on their own turf. The Brazilian fans were furious during this historic moment. Germany ended up lifting the World Cup with Argentina as the runner-ups. The Champions League final in 2018 between Real Madrid and Liverpool was one of the most anticipated games of the year where Liverpool was eyeing victory. Their goalie, Loris Karius, was in tip-top shape, but that night was not his night. The team and fans across the world were shocked when he made not one, but two costly mistakes. The first one was when he accidentally passed the goal to Real Madrid striker, Karim Benzema, near the goal. Karius recovered the goal and didn't see the striker nearby. He miscalculated his pass and awarded the goal to Madrid. The second mistake was when Gareth Bale let loose a curling shot where Karius could have easily caught the ball. But instead of that, he tried to deflect it and the ball slipped past his hand and into the back of the net. Madrid ended up lifting the Champions League trophy and Karius' career was just not the same anymore. But it's cool because Liverpool ended up winning the trophy years later against Tottenham. Another strange fiasco happened during the 2014 World Cup qualifier but not everyone saw this game. It was the United States versus Costa Rica, and they were playing under some of the worst conditions. It was snowing nonstop, and the players were furious. The Costa Rican team even sent out an appeal, suggesting that the game should have never been played, but was ultimately rejected. Team US ended up winning the match 1-0. Another bizarre scene occurred when a goalkeeper decided to check his phone during the game. The player played for Atletico Paranaense of the Brazilian League. No one knew what he was doing, but it was just impressive that he was wearing his goalkeeper gloves while handling his phone. There was a lot of drama in the match between France and Kuwait on June 21, 1982, as the latter were losing 3-1. And just like that, Kuwait conceded another goal. Nothing special except that Kuwait's leader at the time decided to march down the stands and confront the referee himself in the middle of the ongoing match. He just couldn't accept the goal and urged the team to leave the pitch. The ref was pressured to disallow the goal and the game continued. They still ended up conceding a goal late in the game. Arsenal has had a lot of legends in their squad over the decades, but none other than Nicholas Bentner's 1.8 second goal can be matched. It's considered to be the fastest goal ever scored as a substitute in the Premier League. The Danish striker came in as a sub and headed a corner set up by Cesc Fabregas against their ultimate rivals, Tottenham Hotspur. Turning your head to check your phone or go to the bathroom when someone scores a goal is always frustrating. But when someone bags a hat trick in 70 seconds is just on another level frustrating. Alex Tor did that during a match between Ross and Springs and Wynn Gardens. The team won the game 7-1 with his goals coming in between the 11th and 13th minutes. The team was not ready for it. One of the weirdest incidents was when a referee awarded a player a red card while being subbed off. To put it into context, the player, Samuel Incum, had received a yellow card during the match. The rules of football indicate that any player who takes off their jersey during the game will get a big fat yellow card, no matter what. He saw his name to be subbed off, and while walking to the dugout, he took off his jersey, even though he knew he had the yellow card. But he figured, hey, I'm leaving the pitch. What could go wrong? An embarrassing moment happened when the ref had to run up to him and show him the second yellow card, which turned into a red card, and he was sent off. The player waiting to be subbed in couldn't play, and the team had to play one man down. It's a footballer's dream as a child to play for the biggest clubs in the world. Some players decided to do that a little later. Multiple investigations were in action when they discovered that some people have been lying about their age. For example, Goray Muki claimed to be 12 years younger than he was. He was 28 years old when he told his club he was only 16. A penalty shot is always nerve-wracking for both the goalkeeper and the one taking the shot. Lionel Messi, the Argentinian superstar, earned a penalty against Cleta Vigo on February 14, 2016. While it wasn't exactly a romantic time, no one expected what he'd do next. 
Instead of casually taking a kick, he ran down to the spot and passed the ball to the striker, Luis Suarez, in a cheeky attempt to confuse the goalie and excite the crowd. It wasn't the flashiest of moves from Messi, who is considered to be one of the sport's best players in history, but it will go down in history as one of those penalties that will be talked about for a very long time. There's not much to do in Antarctica, except scientific work. You could check out the wildlife, like some cute penguins and seals. And you'd get to see the occasional whale swimming around. Antarctica is one of the biggest lands out there that's only inhabited by scientists and researchers from all over the world. These scientists dug a hole through some pretty thick ice to study the ancient air and how the atmosphere cleans itself. They used a special drill and dug a clean cylindrical hole 450 feet below the surface. Some of this ice can be up to 800,000 years old and is a good indicator of what the climate was like in the past. It's like checking out tree rings to determine how old a certain tree is, except it's more complicated than that. After the effortless digging, they decided to drop some ice to the bottom of the hole to see what would happen next. They heard some really unusual sounds. It felt like being on a spaceship traveling through a bunch of obstacles with many rocks smashing into each other. The pitches changed over the quick descent of the block of ice, ranging from high pitch and ending with a low heartbeat-like sound. The scientists were puzzled when they first heard this and dropped some more ice, only to find out that the same type of sounds were being produced, just in different variations. They couldn't tell what was down there and, more importantly, why these kinds of sounds were produced. Antarctica boasts quite a few volcanoes, many of which are under super thick sheets of ice. Scientists discovered 91 volcanoes and claimed there could be more, potentially making it the most extensive volcanic region in the world. While they were doing regular scientific research, they came across many unmistakable large cone-shaped figures underground. Some were as deep as two miles in the ice. Some of the peaks were over 3,000 feet tall and dozens of miles across. But on the surface, it's as plain as a sheet of paper. They may have dropped that block of ice inside an actual volcano that they were standing on, but it's unlikely. Even though the underground volcano presence was discovered by accident, there's a small chance they were actually standing on one where they had their workstation set up. It's more likely that they worked in an area where studying ancient climates is easier and less dangerous than other places. They collect ice samples and study them in a lab. It's like discovering a prehistoric insect embedded in amber millions of years ago when dinosaurs used to roam the land. But instead of little bugs, scientists study ancient dust, air bubbles, sea salts, volcanic ash, and anything else that may have come from the environment they can practically tell how the climate was during that time. These ice samples might show that Antarctica's western ice sheet melted when the Earth's climate warmed up. If it did, then it's likely to happen again. That would mean sea levels rising, affecting coastal cities and small remote islands. But scientists aren't sure it's true, despite some evidence to back it up. The process of studying ice samples can take a week or even a year, depending on what they find. They crush or melt the sample bit by bit. And like those tree rings, the deeper the layer, the further we go back in time. In order to study ancient bubbles trapped in ice, researchers have to crush the samples under a vacuum hood to keep the air out while extracting the air and putting it in vials. There are various instruments and devices to study the ice samples. But because it's so sensitive to damage, each measurement must be in a clean room setting so that nothing gets compromised. The scientists have to wear proper body suits and many layers of gloves and constantly get ventilated. Even something as tiny and insignificant as a fingerprint can ruin a sample. They look for certain patterns to see changes in the atmosphere's composition and temperature. But dropping a few blocks of ice down a hole wouldn't be so bad. The reason why it made such a peculiar sound is the same reason why a moving car sounds different when it's honking than when it's stationary. The scientific word for it is the Doppler effect. It's an obvious change in the frequency of a wave with respect to an observer who is moving relative to the wave source. The effect doesn't mean the frequency of the sound changes, it just shifts. 
And this can be said about other types of waves, like water and light. But sound waves are the most popular ones when it comes to the Doppler effect. So, when the scientists dropped the ice block down the bottom of the hole, the sound waves traveled back up and bounced around the narrow tube where they drilled. That's why they got the pew pew sound. Let's not forget that this ice block traveled 450 feet beneath us. Oil ships dig holes in the oceanic crust that go thousands of feet beneath the Earth. The Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia is the deepest hole ever made by humans. It goes more than 40,000 feet below the surface and took almost 20 years to reach 7.5 miles. Below it is only half the distance to the mantle. In terms of the whole Earth, this very deep hole is literally scratching the surface. This wasn't a hole to dig for oil and wasn't in the ocean either. The drilling was stopped in 1992 when the engineers found out that the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit higher than they predicted. And then it was abandoned, and it's just been a barren hole now. But that's the closest we've dug to the center of the planet. The scary thing is that some of the workers on the site could hear voices coming from within. All the way in Yemen, an ancient hole exists in Barhut, in the east of the country in the middle of the desert. It's actually closer to Oman than to the capital Sana'a. This hole has puzzled experts and locals. Unlike the holes in Russia and Antarctica, this wasn't man-made. Or was it? It's been around for many years, and the locals try to steer away from it. They don't even like talking about it, since they claim it brings bad luck to those around it or to whoever utters its name. They claim it was created as a prison for spirits, but many rule that out. The hole is 98 feet wide and somewhere between 330 to 650 feet deep. You can also hear strange sounds coming from the inside. But according to some scientists, the well has little to no ventilation and barely has any oxygen down there. So it's unlikely that anyone or anything lives down there. The Challenger Deep in the Mariana Trench caught some low-pitched grumble sounds in March of 2016. Some of these grumbles were followed by screeches. They caught these sounds in a span of weeks, using a titanium-encased microphone so that the immense pressure of the lowest point on Earth wouldn't crush it. They had to lower it slowly as well, since it's 1,000 times the atmospheric pressure at sea level. For 23 whole days, the microphone recorded typical sounds of whales passing by and boats sailing across from above, and even rumbles of nearby earthquakes. But they still couldn't determine what caused those initial sounds. The researchers couldn't understand if the noise from the bottom of the Mariana Trench was caused by humans or was natural. They also wanted to know if these sounds affected marine life, like dolphins and whales that rely on echolocation. They still can't figure it out. But scientists estimate that the ocean is about 10 times noisier than it was 50 years ago. With technological developments in shipping, submarines, and underwater construction, the ocean will only get louder with time. Northern lights come with sounds, which nobody talks about. They're usually audible when the auroras are at their most powerful presence. Scientists were always puzzled as to what caused the faint popping and crackling, even though they were very far above us. They used some special microphones and found out that the sounds came just 230 feet above us, which is pretty low. They're caused by electrical charges gaining power in a specific region of the auroras. The electrical charges are disturbed by magnetic storms that fire up the northern lights. As a result, some tiny sparks are released into the atmosphere, causing the faint crackling and popping noise. You know, there are many doors all around the world that have no keys. Maybe you can guess how to open them. The first destination is... Okay, read this, and good luck to you. It's a temple in India. The temple's name comes from this other really long word, which can be translated as the one emerging from the lotus. This temple is one of India's most popular and sacred places. It's one of 108 temples of this word. It dates way back. It was mentioned in Tamil literature in the 6th century. Flash forward to our time. In 2011, the Indian Supreme Court decided to document the valuables of the temple because they had been informed that the place might have been misused. To do so, they had to open the doors that had been closed for centuries. 
the committee went to the temple and discovered six huge secret vaults that held unbelievable treasures. After the chamber doors opened, they found at least $22 billion worth of golden idols, necklaces, and coins. The officials also discovered ceremonial costumes and gold coconut shells with jewels. Plus, they saw large diamonds. Not our understanding of large, though. Some of these precious stones were as large as 110 carats. To put it in perspective, a small solid gold statue from the collection could be worth around $30 million. After this fairy tale-ish treasure had been discovered, the temple got equipped with metal detectors, cameras, and other safety precautions before the first visitor started to arrive. Now, there are a lot of security guards at the temple. But are they protecting the treasure, or is there something more mysterious hiding behind its doors? The temple has six chambers, and the valuables are kept there. These rooms are named Chambers A through F. The expedition committee opened five of these vaults with significant effort. But the most bizarre thing is that, despite all the efforts involving existing tech, the mysterious Chamber B still wouldn't open. On the side of the door, two carved cobras are welcoming you. The door works as a gate. You can easily see it with the unaided eye, just like the doors leading to other chambers. Surprise! Experts discover two more doors behind the first one. The second door is wooden, and the last one is made of iron. Strangely, the last door was sealed. It also doesn't have any means of entry, no bolts, handles, latches, or anything else. To this day, no one knows what's inside Chamber B. Believers say that opening the door against its will can release into the world unnameable things. Others say that Chamber B may hide a tunnel. It might not be related to the reasons above, but the High Court of India warned against opening the doors of Chamber B. Now, in 2010, David Crespi, a French engineer, visited Machu Picchu. He discovered a strange door in one of the main buildings. The door was in a narrow path neither tourists nor archaeologists used very often. David believed that the place was an entrance the Incas had sealed for some reason. He contacted archaeologists and authorities right away. They promised him to start investigating the area in the near future and let him know about his potential discovery. Well, months passed, but he didn't get any news. No response to his emails and calls. In 2011, he found an article by Terry Jameen about Peru. David reached out to him in no time. He described his finding to Jameen. After that, Jameen and other archaeologists went to Machu Picchu to investigate the secret door. They concluded that this door was indeed an entrance sealed by the Incas. The researchers confirmed the existence of two entrances found behind the famous door. They also got the 3D representation of a staircase leading to the main room and another chamber. The analysis also revealed several cavities, among which there was a vast quadrangular room. Plus, geo-radars detected some metals. Those might be golden and silver objects. Jameen and his team thought this place was a chamber of pre-Hispanic times. They believed the door had been sealed by the Incas to hide something important. Maybe an enormous treasure, or something no less precious. Jameen also claimed that finding this chamber could lead to the discovery of a mausoleum. Jameen submitted an official request to the Peruvian authorities for permission to open the chambers. Yet, neither his application nor requests of other archaeologists have been approved so far. Authorities claim that opening this door could cause damage on the other sides of the archaeological site. Yet, the use of an endoscopic camera has confirmed the hypothesis that the stone blocks at the entrance are only there to close the passage. They are not there to support the internal structures of the building. The third mystery is in Giza, Egypt. Explorers uncovered two secret doors inside the Great Pyramid. There are two tunnels, each around 8 inches wide, that go from the north and south walls of the Queen's Chamber. But the tunnels are closed by stone blocks before they reach the outside of the pyramid. So, where are they leading to? No one really knows the true purpose of these tunnels. Some archaeologists think these doors might be hiding a yet undiscovered chamber. Egyptologist Zahi Hawass explained how these doors were first found. 
A robot designed for this expedition was sent inside the shafts of the Queen's Chamber to find out what was there. The research team attached a camera to the robot. The footage revealed that behind the stone door, there was another sealed door. The archaeologists were thrilled to see this door instead of just a dead end. The structure of the stone door blocks the other doors perfectly. Experts think it's an incredible bit of engineering. Now, it's not possible to reach the door because it's behind a huge stone block. But archaeologists are trying to find a way to get there without damaging other parts of the structure. These new discoveries have only raised more questions instead of answering the already existing ones. Secrets are still waiting to be revealed. Our final stop is the Taj Mahal, a monument to love. Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan made this memorial to honor the memory of his beloved wife, Mumtaz Mahal. The total number of doors in the Taj Mahal is so great, this video would be days long if we started talking about all the sealed rooms. Experts think that if someone opened these doors after they've been closed for so long, it released carbon monoxide. And when this gas meets the marble, it forms calcium carbonate. That's why this could lead to the appearance of cracks in the minarets of the Taj Mahal. Also, a legend says that if these doors get open, a dreadful curse will be unleashed from the mausoleum's underground chambers. And here's a bonus from Canada. The door of room 873. This is a room at the Fairmont Banff Springs Hotel, which opened in 1888. The story goes like this. Decades ago, someone committed a crime in this room. After the investigation, the hotel administration refurbished the room and rented it out to other travelers. But rumor has it, other guests who stayed in the room later also faced unpleasant situations. They reported hearing strange noises. The TV in the room kept flickering. It's guessed that the door of room 873 was sealed with bricks. Curious guests who heard these mysterious stories wander along the corridor where the room used to be and knock on the walls to contact potential ghosts. Well, which of these secret doors would you like to open? One of the most unexplored and mysterious places on Earth is located in plain sight. It's one of the most majestic monuments of humankind. The wonder of the ancient world hides a secret that scientists and archaeologists still can't solve. This is the Great Sphinx of Giza in Egypt. The huge sculpture of a lion with a human head was carved out of rock about four and a half thousand years ago. Scientists still don't know the exact date of its creation and are also unaware of who built it and what for. There are many assumptions and theories, but none of them has been confirmed. Most people have seen this majestic sculpture either in photographs or in reality, but almost no one knows what's hidden underneath it. The statue of the Sphinx was carved from a single piece of limestone. It was painted. The remains of color pigment on the surface prove this. In the distant past, the Sphinx looked much brighter and more colorful than what we see now. But even after thousands of years, its greatness hasn't diminished. And by the way, Sphinx is not the real name. It was invented by the Greeks about a hundred years or more after its creation. Initially, the Egyptians called the statue hor em -Akit. There are many legends and theories saying the Sphinx is there for a reason. It's like a watchdog that guards the tomb of the pharaoh and the secrets of ancient Egypt. These legends become more plausible when archaeologists discovered hidden entrances at the feet of the Sphinx. They believe that these secret passages are the beginning of the tunnels leading to the halls with treasures. You can find a lot of stories on the internet that claim the Sphinx hides the Hall of Records, a repository filled with ancient and secret knowledge. One of the main artifacts of this repository is supposed to be the records of the ancient mythical state of Atlantis. According to legends, the entire library from this city was moved under the Sphinx. The entrance to this library must be located next to the Sphinx's right paw. Many archaeologists tried to find this entrance, but came away empty-handed. Also, there are many images with detailed diagrams of the underground city that consists of a network of tunnels and chambers under the Sphinx. 
Someone says there are structures as tall as 12-story buildings hiding underground. But there's no evidence of this. Archaeologists, even after millennia, continue to explore the mysterious sculpture. At the same time, many Egyptians don't want to learn more about the Sphinx. They're terrified of awakening something supernatural. In 1998, scientists discovered tunnels leading to empty caves under the Sphinx. They found evidence of earlier excavations there. It's quite possible that someone managed to find the treasures and take them away. Some people believe Egyptians found some kind of artifact under the Sphinx that has the power of unknown advanced technologies. The artifact is so powerful that it can change the course of history. Of course, most theories are just fairy tales of conspiracy fans, but it's a confirmed fact that the Sphinx hides a system of caves and rooms. There are so many rumors surrounding the Sphinx that it's impossible to understand what's true and what's false. In any case, it's difficult and dangerous to study the sculpture because active excavations can destroy it. And then the entrance to the underground rooms can get blocked by rocks and lost forever. Also, further exploration requires a lot of money and financing is not always easy to find. But the main reason? It's too risky. There's no guarantee that people will be able to get out of the underground labyrinths. For these reasons, scientists and archaeologists have been exploring this majestic structure for so long. Another famous architectural monument with a secret is Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. Everyone admires the images of the U.S. president's faces carved into the rock, but few people know that there's a secret room hidden behind the head of Abraham Lincoln. The architect of Mount Rushmore wanted to carve slabs on the rock with the record of the main stages of the country's history. But his plan was too complicated to carry out. Then he was offered to implement it on a much smaller scale, to build a secret room inside the mountain. The idea was to save this knowledge so that future generations will always remember the history of their country. Unfortunately, the architect didn't have time to finish his work. The construction stopped for several decades. But in the late 90s, the project was resumed. Porcelain enamel panels depicting the history of the U.S. were placed in the room. It's possible that these plates will be stored there forever. But people can't see them, at least for now. The room is inaccessible to tourists as it's too difficult to get inside. Another secret room is located in the Empire State Building. More precisely, it's not even a room, but a place where you can take cool photos. Almost all tourists gather on the observation deck of the 86th floor to enjoy a stunning view of Manhattan. But there's another deck with panoramic windows on the 102nd floor. There are way fewer people there because almost no one knows about that place. Fortunately, access to this deck is open to everyone. You probably won't have to wait in line for a long time to take a photo. You'll feel special because you're in such a secret place where there are almost no people. But the coolest place is even higher, on the 103rd floor. This is a spacious observation deck where celebrities get their photographs taken. It's not a public place, but if you know the right people, you can get there. There are almost no security measures on the site. Only a low ledge between you and an abyss. That's why crowds of people are forbidden from coming here. It's not so easy to get there. And you're unlikely to succeed without a guide. First, you need to choose the right elevator that will take you there. Then you'll go through several engineering rooms filled with pipes, electrical panels, and other technical stuff. The final part of your way is a set of stairs inside a tiny corridor. And here you are, at the top of New York. Now we're in Paris. <laughs> See the Eiffel Tower? Inside it, there are restaurants and observation decks. But if you try hard, you can find a secret apartment. Now it's a museum, but it was built so that people could live in it. The architect of the tower, Gustav Eiffel, created this apartment in 1889 for himself. It's almost at the very top of the Eiffel Tower. 
imagine what a beautiful view he observed every day. He was the first and only tenant. No one else could gain access to this place. When the architect passed away, the apartment remained empty for a long time. Only recently, they restored it and turned it into a museum. Inside, the epoch of the last century is recreated. They even put wax figures of Gustav Eiffel, his daughter, and the American inventor Thomas Edison inside the room. This place is filled with an endless stream of passengers, office workers running late, visitors from other cities, noise, and train whistles. At Grand Central Station in New York, among all these sounds, you can hear the sound of a ball hitting a racket, if you're in the right place. A real tennis court is hidden inside New York Central Station. It belongs to a tennis club that arranges corporate games for employees of many companies. The club was opened in the 60s. Now we're moving to London, Charing Cross Road. It isn't easy to find one secret place here. To do this, you need to look carefully at your feet. Do you see these sewer grates in the asphalt? Inside them, you can notice two signs with the name Little Compton Street. Yeah, there's another street right below you. It disappeared from all maps at the end of the 19th century. Charing Cross Road was built over it. The identification signs that you see are part of old engineering tunnels. There's another interesting place in London. It's located in the southeast corner of Trafalgar Square. At first glance, it looks like a thick lamppost, but there are too many tourists walking around. You come closer and realize that one person can easily fit inside the post. The lamppost belongs not to an electrician, but to a police officer. Yeah, this is the smallest police station in the world. It was built in the 1930s and used as a watch post. Officers had to sit there one by one and watch Trafalgar Square that always attracted a lot of pickpockets and all kinds of other criminals. There are many myths around arguably the greatest structure ever built by humans, the Great Wall of China. Some say it's so grand that it's visible from space. Others claim that you can see it from as far as the moon. Other theories suggest that the builders of the wall were left inside. Well, sorry to disappoint you, but all these impressive stories are just myths. But even with those stories busted, the Great Wall of China is an impressive and truly breathtaking structure. So let me tell you its true story. Today, China is one of the most populated countries in the world, counting as many as 1.4 billion residents. It's also one of the oldest nations in the world. It has 3,500 years of continuous written history. But the civilization existed long before that. There is a theory that while the European continent, for example, was most likely reached by humans from Africa, China wasn't populated by settlers that came from somewhere else. Some people believe that the Chinese civilization got formed from local Stone Age people who lived on the territory since the prehistoric period. So now, the Great Wall of China. It's truly big even by today's standard, stretching for over 13,000 miles. To imagine it better, it's almost five times the distance between New York and Los Angeles. Or even a bit greater than the distance between the North and South Poles. Even in modern times, people have never built anything close to this big. Of course, it didn't take a day to build the Great Wall of China. Two, eh, keep going. In fact, the wall was being built for centuries. Maybe you know that ancient cities had walls around them to protect themselves from invaders. Yes, Chinese cities had them too. The first Chinese emperor united the country in 220 BCE and got a brilliant but very ambitious idea to turn all city walls into one big wall that would defend the country's border against attacks from the north. A trusted general directed the construction, enrolling a big group of workers, soldiers, commoners, and convicts. Back then, the wall was built of rammed earth and wood. In some places that were strategically important, the sections of the wall overlapped to provide maximum security. The walls were around 26 feet high on average. 
But the Great Wall didn't yet look like the construction we know today. Every next emperor would pick up the Big Wall project, strengthening and extending it, repairing, but also modernizing construction techniques. Some used bricks to build it. Others moved on to granite and marble blocks. Watchtowers and platforms weren't there from the beginning as well. They were added by Ming emperors. The watchtowers made it possible to communicate with other parts of the wall through smoke and fire messages. So the wall is quite inconsistent in terms of material, but it only adds more charm to the construction and shows how much effort and time it took. The reasons why some parts of the wall have been standing for centuries and are still in good condition is glutinous rice flour. Turns out, this sticky rice mortar is almost like cement. It's very strong and waterproof, sealing the bricks so tightly together that even sneaky weeds can't grow between them. You may also notice that some bricks have writings carved on them. They were left by the workers who were building the wall. The purpose of those writings is quality assurance. They contain such information as location, quantity, and responsible officials. So, in the case of some problems with the quality of materials or constructions, it would be known who should be held accountable for it. Recently, a research group has looked through official historical documents of the Ming Dynasty that ruled China from the 14th to the 17th centuries. They came across records of secret doors in the Great Wall. So they decided to find them. They used a flying robot to capture continuous centimeter resolution photos of the wall. They photographed 90% of the wall that was built during the Ming Dynasty and discovered the remains of over 220 secret doors along the wall. Some of them have a specific width and height that allows only one person to go through. Others are large enough to allow two horses to pass at the same time. Why are the doors there? Well, the Great Wall's main goal was to protect the country from the enemy. Building doors that could let the enemy in would undermine the whole point of having a wall. So, of course, the doors were secret passages. They perfectly matched the surroundings topographically. And the exit on the outside was camouflaged with bricks so that it was almost completely indistinguishable from the brick wall. The wall was never just a defensive wall, and it was never completely closed. It could be opened on demand. It was also a structure used for trade and commerce, communication between inside and outside the wall, and of course, for defense and spying. Some doors were used for trade with the other side. Through smaller doors, a person would sneak out to spy on the enemy that lived on the other side. The hidden gates were also useful for a sudden attack. As you remember, some gates were camouflaged with brick on the outside. The exit was so indistinguishable that the enemy had no idea exactly where it was located. The inside entrance for Chinese soldiers was hollow, so they could walk through the wall and break the camouflaged exit gate from the inside, starting their surprise attack. Now, even though the main point was to prevent outsiders from getting into the city, the wall wasn't too effective on that matter. It could still be climbed over or marched around. So the wall was being watched at all times, and the guards gave signals to the troops if they saw the enemy approach. Also, the wall provided more time to mobilize and bulk up the country's forces or lure the enemy troops into a difficult strategic position. The construction stopped at the end of the 19th century. The wall lost its strategic and military importance due to technological advances. Over the centuries to today, only 8% of the Great Wall is in good condition, and the rest is damaged. Also, around one-third of the wall has disappeared without a trace, due to both natural erosion and human damage. I guess you could say it's now just a pretty good wall. As you remember, the first parts of the wall were built out of rammed earth and wood. These are not the most unfailing materials if we're talking about thousands of years. Also, destructive farming methods have turned large areas into a desert and contributed to erosion. Also, many bricks were taken away from the wall in the last century to be used in building farms and houses. The wall is being deconstructed stone by stone even today, but this time by tourists. Quite a few of them take a stone as a souvenir. That's a total of a lot of stones, 
considering that over 10 million tourists visit the Great Wall every year. Since 1987, the wall has been a UNESCO World Heritage Site, highlighting that it has an outstanding importance to humanity. The wall is one of China's 56 World Heritage Sites, second place among countries with landmarks protected by UNESCO. Who's first, you ask? Well, the top spot, with 58 World Heritage Sites, belongs to Italy. And do you know that the wall isn't only a famous tourist attraction, but also the location of the Great Wall Marathon? It's a marathon that was established in 1999 and is one of the most challenging ones in the world. You guessed right, people run along the wall, including all the steps. There are three distances, so that participants can run a full marathon that is 26 miles, a half marathon that's 13 miles, or just have a fun run of 5 miles. You find yourself at a food fair in Iceland when you see it for the first time. Volcano bread! You eat a slice and oddly enough, it actually tastes good. Unsure of how this works, you check out mm -hmm. the baking process. Hmm. Is this kitchen really strange looking, or is it just me? The baking spot is in nature, specifically in a hot springs field. You better watch your steps so you don't get burned by the hot vapor jolting from the ground. Now, a local baker shares their traditional rye bread recipe with you. Rye flour, check. Yeast, check. You mix it all together and pour it into a metal pot. Next on the list is digging the hole where you'll place the pot to bake. You dig for about 16 inches until you can see the water bubbling from the ground. If you want to do it like a local, you'll use your finger to check the water temperature. Yikes! That's hot! Actually, the ground is heated by lava. Iceland is one of the most volcanic regions in the world, with over 30 active volcanoes at any one time. After you bury the bread in volcanic soil, you leave it there and wait 24 hours until it's ready. The next day, the bread is fully baked and super tasty. Ah, and the best part is, you just participated in an ancient Icelandic tradition. People have been doing this since at least the 1800s. Imagine it's your first day of work in a museum, and your assigned task is to clean the mask of Tutankhamun. You grab your cleaning utensils and then, oh no, this can't be happening. You just broke Tutankhamun's beard. I never wish this to happen to anyone, but this is actually a true story. Back in 2014, an employee at the Egyptian Museum knocked off the beard of Tutankhamun's mask and glued it back on, hoping no one would notice. This mask was discovered in 1922 and is considered one of the 10 symbols of our human civilization. Oh, and the best part of this story? It took historians until 2016 to discover the poor glue job. So, if you visited the museum between 2004 and 2016, maybe you saw the glued beard. If I say Sahara, what comes to mind? An infinite desert landscape, right? Well, according to scientists, the Sahara isn't always a desert. From time to time, it becomes green. But you probably won't be seeing this in your lifetime. Every 10,000 years, the Sahara lives through a humid period where the sand gives way to lush green vegetation and sparkling lakes. This happens due to a tilt in the Earth's axis, which affects different weather patterns around the globe. Can you imagine the Sphinx surrounded by rainforest? It's mind-blowing! And speaking of the Sahara, say you traveled back to 1800 BCE. If you timed it right, you might get to see the construction of the so-called Black Pyramid in the city of Dashur. These are not the famous Giza pyramids, but they serve the similar purpose of being a final resting place. In 1892, archaeologists excavating the area found an important part of the Black Pyramid that was lost for centuries. The Benben, also called a Pyramidian, was the tip of ancient Egyptian pyramids. A Benben consists of a solid block, usually made of limestone. Most of them were covered with gold and reflected the first rays of light from the sun every day. Hmm, can anyone get me a time machine, please? Remember when you ate something really spicy, your cheeks turned red? Apparently, that can happen to birds, too. For example, canaries can change colors after eating peppers. 
These birds have a special pigment that allows them to switch shades depending on their diet. So, if a yellow canary eats red peppers, it can turn orange or red. Can rocks move on the ground on their own? Well, you might be under that impression if you visit Racetrack Playa in California. The site is a dry lake bed and home to one of the world's strangest phenomena, the so-called sailing stones. Think 100-pound rocks moving around alone, leaving behind trails as long as 1,500 feet. They were discovered in the 1900s, and until recently, no one was lucky enough to be on the site while they were moving. It was only in 2014, after much observation and research, that scientists solved this mystery. The sailing stones appeared because of the perfect balance between wind, ice, and water. When it rains, the water that falls on the ground freezes and forms a coat of ice above the ground. If it's windy, the rocks are easily pushed around, sailing along the lake bed. But hey, if you ever visit Racetrack Playa, don't disturb the rocks. On the western coast of France, you'll find the vacation hotspot known as the Island of Ray. It attracts tourists looking for scenic landscapes and beautiful beaches, but that's not all it's famous for. There, an extraordinary phenomenon occurs when two different wave patterns collide with each other, something called a cross sea. It's almost as if the sea were a checkerboard divided into hundreds of squares. And no, it's not an optical illusion. A cross sea only happens in places where different quality waters meet. For a tourist to see the cross sea in Ray, this probably means that there was a storm in a different sea nearby. This stormy water travels with the help of currents and meets the water of Ray, creating these oddly shaped riptides. Oh, and apart from this island and Israel, there's nowhere else in the world where you could see such a thing. The following sight will either give you goosebumps or make you marvel at its weirdness. I'd say it depends on the time of day you visit. Next to the small town of Grifina in Poland, you'll find a very unusual sight a pine tree forest where each tree is bent at its base. If you visit during the daytime, I guess you'll be fascinated by these trees' sharp 90-degree curves. You can even use their trunks as a stool if you decide to have a picnic, for example. But visiting the site at night will most likely give you chills. A thin layer of fog hovers around, making the forest seem quite unwelcoming. Scientists still can't explain why the trees are the way they are. So, are you a daytime or nighttime visitor? You went for a hike and suddenly encountered a big cloud of fog. This may ruin your photo ops, but there's one thing you can hope for. Foggy days are the perfect conditions for a phenomenon called fog bow, otherwise known as a white rainbow. This happens because of numerous tiny water droplets that cause fog, smaller than 0.002 inches. So, instead of the multicolored bow, you get a transparent one, with red outer edges and a bluish inner edge. Now, say you're roaming in a little town in Europe, appreciating the century-old buildings and good summer weather. You feel hungry and decide to type into your Google Maps the name of that restaurant your friend recommended. Ah, it's only 10 minutes away by foot. You follow the blue dot on your GPS and arrive at your destination, quick and easy. We all love this free piece of technology, don't we? But what if I told you that the US spends over $2 million daily to maintain the satellites to make it work? Yep, that's the price. And to implement it, they spent over 12 billion US dollars. Have you ever heard of something called a natural snowball? This could be proof that nature is really perfect. In 2016, the beaches of the Gulf of Ob in northwest Siberia were filled with rows of giant snowballs. Think balls measuring up to three feet across. This rare yet beautiful natural phenomenon happens when small pieces of ice are rolled by strong winds and water. The further they roll, the more ice they gather and the more that ice is polished. They end up as giant, perfectly shaped snowballs. They look pretty amazing on their own, but it's quite a sight when hundreds of them are together. This summer, you finally decide to go on that once-in-a-lifetime round-the-world trip. The first stop of this exciting adventure is in Europe. You start your journey in Italy, the country of pasta and pizza and delicious gelato. 
Ah, there it is! The world-renowned Leaning Tower of Pisa. You buy your ticket and get inside the crooked monument. You're about to climb 251 slippery stairs, so watch your step and don't forget to breathe. The white marble stones are astounding, and from time to time, you peep outside to enjoy the view of the city. Congratulations, you've made it! You've reached the top of the bell tower and can take all the selfies you want. The Leaning Tower of Pisa is one of Italy's most iconic landmarks. During your hike up the stairs, a guide tells you it's actually a medieval monument. It was built between the 12th and 14th centuries, taking over 200 years to finish. And in case you're wondering if it's always been tilted, I can say without a doubt, yes it has. Once they finished the third floor, the bell tower started sinking. The thing is, the very name Pisa comes from the Greek word that means marshy land. The ground there is extremely soft, made of clay, mud, and sand. And architects have been trying to save the day ever since they built the tower. At the top of the 185-foot-tall monument, you take your time admiring the city. How many terracotta rooftops can you count? If you walk toward the south side of the monument, you may feel closer to the ground. This is because the Leaning Tower of Pisa tilts toward the south. At one point, it leaned almost 5.5 degrees and still didn't fall. Today, when you visit the monument, the guide might tell you the tower is leaning less. A few years ago, the world's best architects and engineers did some construction works next to the monument to keep it from falling over. They dug several tunnels and took out over 38 cubic meters of soil from under the north side of the tower. So now the tower is tilting at an angle of only 4 degrees. So if you want to take one of those classic photos where you're holding up the tower, you better hurry. Who knows how long the tower will still be leaning. Now it's time for you to make your way to Rome. This city is basically an open-air museum, and you have to check it out for yourself. It's scalding hot, but you're lucky. Today, you're visiting the Baths of Caracalla. Are you ready for an authentic ancient Roman experience? You enter through what once was a locker room. You'll have to use your imagination. Today, you'll only see 130-foot-tall brick walls here. Romans of every class would spend an hour or two in the baths every day. They would come after a long day at work or before dinner. Imperial bath complexes, such as this one, were usually free, but you had to pay an admission fee. Leaving the locker room, visitors would stop in a heated room where they would receive oil and scrub massage. Then, some people would move on to one of two exercise yards. Can you see how ample they were? Here, there were elaborate marble porticos, and you can still see a few fragments of the mosaic-colored floor. If you were in the mood for something more intellectual, you could stop to listen to a philosopher or visit one of the libraries. Now we've arrived at the most impressive room, a caldarium. It was a circular hot steamed room measuring 115 feet in diameter. It had not one or two, but seven heated pools inside. Above your head, you'd have seen a magnificent dome supported by large granite columns. The entire structure was richly decorated with multicolored glass mosaics and the finest white marble. The complex also housed an indoor Olympic-sized pool with waist-deep water. Today, you can only admire a few reddish walls made of brick and concrete. Emperor Caracalla, like many other Roman emperors, built a mega-complex, and it sure made people happy. After a long international flight, you arrive in Egypt. Get ready for some camel rides and juicy dried fruits. Does anyone here love dates? You leave your hotel at dawn and make your way to the outskirts of Cairo. You drive past the Nile River toward the West Bank. Don't forget to take some pictures. In the distance, you spot a large monument. It's the Great Sphinx of Giza. Can you believe people created this monument over 4,500 years ago? Once you get closer, you see the Great Pyramids just north of the Sphinx. You learn that, unlike the pyramids, the Sphinx was carved directly from the bedrock of the Giza Plateau. Until today, it's one of the largest statues in the world, measuring 66 feet in height and 240 feet in length from paws to tail. The face of the Sphinx looks a tad beaten today. But according to archaeologists, it wasn't always like that. 
A Photoshop reconstruction of the Sphinx gives it a very different look. As you can see, at one point, the Sphinx's nose was chopped off together with parts of the chin. Scientists believe that the statue is a representation of the great pharaoh Khafre. This is why its face resembles a human so much. Just below the eyes, a dark carved line was added to represent the charcoal eyeliner ancient Egyptians used to wear. Fun fact, this wasn't only a beauty habit. It protected their eyes from ultraviolet rays. In a desert region that gets so much sunlight, this might come in handy. Until today, researchers debate whether or not the Sphinx had a beard. Many believe that if it was meant to depict a pharaoh, it most likely had a braided beard that got destroyed by erosion or humans. Even today, you can still see the remains of a regal headdress on the head of the Sphinx. These head ornaments were associated with power and royalty. Now imagine that the stripes are blue and gold. This is probably what it looked like when the monument was first constructed. There's no evidence of how long it took to build the Sphinx, but it was likely very long, as the carved details are pretty impressive. If you're lucky, your guide might take you to one of the secret chambers inside the statue. If they're real and not just a myth, I mean. Ah, the crystalline waters of Greece. Whether you arrive by boat or plane, you're in for a real treat. This is the focal point of archaeological sites. You arrive at Mandraki Marina in port, but wait a minute, you don't see any monuments around. The Colossus of Rhodes is nowhere to be found at first glance. That's because it was destroyed long, long ago. Before tumbling down during a mighty earthquake, the great statue was considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. If you saw the Colossus in a picture, you would probably mistake it for Lady Liberty. Well, that's actually not a coincidence. Apparently, there's a connection between the Statue of Rhodes and the Statue of Liberty. They were both built as symbols of freedom, and Lady Liberty is often referred to as the modern Colossus. The Colossus stood at 100 feet tall, but today, all you see is a concrete jetty with a huge gap in the middle. Now, imagine a bronze statue straddling both ends of the bridge. The Colossus was built back in the 3rd century BCE, and 900 camels took part in the construction. The statue existed for approximately 54 years before it was ruined by a powerful earthquake. It hit the city so hard that all that was left of the statue was one very large foot. Even so, people kept visiting the monument. Are you ready to head home? Thanks for joining me on this journey, and don't forget to tell me what your favorite site was. See you next time! Imagine dark labyrinths, deep, deep underground. They're full of hidden dangers and unexpected discoveries. Get your flashlight, and let me take you on a tour of the spookiest caves of all time. And the first destination on our list is Cathedral Caverns in Alabama. Originally, this place was called Bat Cave but it was later renamed because of what it looks like. As you approach it, you can't help but notice its huge entrance, measuring 126 feet wide and 25 feet high. But this grand entrance is just the beginning. Inside the cave, there are some of the most beautiful formations nature has ever created. One of the most famous of them is probably Goliath, a giant 45 feet tall stalagmite with a circumference of 243 feet. Other amazing sites you might want to visit include a caveman balancing on top of a flowstone wall, a frozen waterfall, and a forest of tall stalagmites. You're probably curious, how did such an exciting place make it onto the list of the scariest caves out there? The thing is, the sheer size of the cave is still unknown, and only about two miles of it are mapped and open to the public. But the cave can and does show its dangerous side from time to time. For example, the directors of the 1984 sci-fi movie What Waits Below filmed a lot of scenes in Cathedral Caverns. But during the shooting, 17 cast and crew members got carbon monoxide poisoning and had to be immediately taken to a hospital barely avoiding serious consequences. But let's move further to Moaning Cavern in California. 
What makes it particularly creepy is the bizarre breathing sound. It's produced by water dripping through bottle-like openings at the base of the cave. If a person who's unaware of the nature of this breathing comes close, this ominous respiration might cause them to steer clear of the place. On the other hand, these moaning sounds might have evoked curiosity in some adventurous souls. And usually, it didn't end well. Researchers have found the remains of more than 100 prehistoric people who fell down the cave's 410-foot chasm around 13,000 years ago. These days, you can go on a tour around the cave, but no deeper than 165 feet into the vertical opening. If you're feeling particularly bold, you can rappel down. But you'll still have to exit using a gothic-looking wrought iron staircase. Be careful not to slip. It's a long way down. The next cave we'll visit is ominously called Hell Hole. You can find it in West Virginia. It's notorious enough to inspire a few horror movies. Despite its name, the place is chilly, but no less creepy for this discrepancy. The average temperature inside the cave is 47 degrees Fahrenheit which makes it the perfect home for a large variety of bats and other rare cave-dwelling inhabitants. In fact, in the winter, the cave accommodates about half of the world's population of Virginia big-eared bats. These are critically endangered and highly vulnerable creatures. But it won't stop a chill from running down your spine once you see a cloud of 20,000 squeaking, wing-fluttering bats. Bell Witch Cave is a relatively small formation located in Tennessee. And despite its innocent appearance, it serves as the focal point for an equally fantastic and terrifying story. According to the legend, in the early part of the 19th century, the farmer and his family suffered from the mischief of a ghost. It made a lot of noise at night, ripped sheets from beds, and even physically attacked the farmer and some of his family members. Eventually, the farmer passed away, and a vial with unknown black liquid was found next to him. Some people believed that the ghost had somehow poisoned him. Soon after that, the spirit left the farmer's family alone. Locals were sure the ghost had returned to a cave near the farm. They also believed the mystical creature promised to return when the time was right. Even today, Local inhabitants report strange occurrences happening around the cave. They swear they are linked to the ghost, once taunting the farmer's family. I bet that no matter how skeptical you are, the cave will make your skin crawl. And this is Wind Cave in South Dakota. At first glance, it might seem that there's nothing super scary about this cavern. No roiling mass of bats, no ancient remains or toxic gases, but the cave is home to a blood-chilling and very rare geological feature. Nowhere else in the world will you find a more extensive network of boxwork calcite. How did Wind Cave create the perfect conditions for the boxwork remains? It's still a mystery, but what you do notice is that this boxwork resembles a massive spider web a bit too much for comfort. Even though it's just a geological anomaly, it's hard to look at the boxwork and not imagine tons of cave spiders skittering along those thin strands of hardened minerals. Now, let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. There's nothing mysterious or dangerous about this place, but it's kinda unique. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about five and a half million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Because of such long isolation, the conditions inside Mobile Cave are like nowhere else in the world. Despite a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave and the toxicity of the air, a unique ecosystem is flourishing there. The cave is located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, and it was first found in 1986. These days, you can only visit it if you have special permission. But even if you have it, the central caverns are guarded naturally. 
by super narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, those who are familiar with claustrophobia shouldn't enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. It contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide, which means it's not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species living there. 33 of them are unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny. They have long limbs and antennae, helping them navigate in the dark. They also have no vision and lack pigment, which makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, get ready to explore one more cave. No less amazing, but very different. This is the Giant Crystal Cave, a.k.a. Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. These massive crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then entered the drying cave on foot and saw the crystals. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better, since Giant Crystal Cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually, the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white-tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. There's a heavy snowstorm. The cold penetrates his bones. His legs are almost knee-deep in snow. Experienced hunter Joe LaBelle makes his way through the forest, covering his face from the headwind. Any other person would have already fallen and screamed in despair, but not Joe LaBelle. He can survive in any circumstances and always knows what to do. Right now, he's heading to one of the villages in the far north of Canada. This small settlement is located on Lake Anjakuni. The inhabitants of this village are Inuit, indigenous people of North America. Joe hasn't eaten or drunk for a long time. He needs a good sleep and a hot meal, which he hopes to get from the hospitable Inuits. Through trees and a white haze, he notices the silhouettes of tents. Smoke is coming from some houses. Joe will probably get there in time for lunch. He reaches the village and, at this moment, the wind calms down. The blizzard has ended. The hunter speeds up and goes toward the village, located along the frozen lake. It's strange, but there are no locals anywhere. Probably everyone is just sitting in their houses, waiting out the blizzard. Hello, Joe says loudly, but gets no response. Oh, great, smoke is coming out of this tent. Joe knocks on the wall, but no one opens it. He knocks a few more times and goes inside. The little tent is empty. All things are in their places. There's a piece of cloth with needles and thread on the table. Firewood is smoldering in the fireplace. It seems that people have just left this place. Joe goes into the next tent and sees the same picture. All things are in their places, but there are no people. Joe walks past the tents and sees a pit where a bonfire once burned. There's a rope above it, with the meat that the Inuit were cooking hanging on it. For some reason, they didn't eat it. Lake Anjakuni is part of a chain of waterways. Here, the Inuits fished and traded various goods. 
Usually, there are many people here, but now something has forced them to leave their homes. Why did they leave their things behind? And where did they go? There are no tracks around the village. All the sleds are in place. The Inuits have even left their dogs here. And dogs help them to hunt and ride sleighs. No one will leave warm clothes and dogs here when moving away, especially in severe weather. Joe LaBelle knows all this, so he concludes that something terrible has happened here. His body is shaking, not from the cold, but from...